Spooky goings on on the box now, and bangings in the walls. Or is that just pipes? We look back over TV ghosts in the machine. Even Doris couldn't have guessed how ghosts would one day take over TV. They made their move at 9.30 on the Halloween of 1992 in a memorable show called Ghost Watch. It's the biggest poltergeist happening that you'd ever see. The cause of furore, uh, I mean, the, the BBC switchboard was jammed during the programme. There were really two intentions in Ghost Watch. One was to do a really good modern ghost story, and the other thing was a kind of satire about television. Both the satire and the ghost story are about belief. The uh, ghost story is about what you believe or choose to believe or what you see or don't see. But also, in terms of the satire of television, it's about what do you believe you're watching? Uh, do you trust what you're being told by the experts? So welcome live this Halloween night to the first ever TV Ghost Watch. That's a scene in... Uh, ghost Watch was a traditional ghost story disguised as a live broadcast from a real street with real presenters. Boom! I bet that's scared, isn't it? I was thinking, what would the BBC do if they were really doing this on Halloween night? Well, of course, they'd have some cheeky chappy to make jokes with the public on the street, you know. Parky at the centre of it all, giving the performance of his life. And then you've got really the kind of the golden couple of the, of the small screen of the period, um, Smithy and Sarah, Sarah Green. Situation. Do I have to go first? What makes the, the horror of Ghostwatch so chilling is, is the context. You do not expect to be frightened if you've got Sarah Green in front of your eyes. The show was billed as a drama in the Radio Times and introduced as part of the Screen One season. But even as the titles faded, the ghosts were in the machine. There was a movie going out on ITV that night and a commercial break happened just after the start of Ghost Watch. People flicked around as they do and they saw this programme happening with an outside broadcast unit in North Holt, in West London, and a great big studio set up. And to all intents and purposes, they were watching a live broadcast. They wouldn't have heard that initial announcement. And so a lot of people did believe they were watching a live show. The drama centred on a West London family pestered by a particularly persistent oh, yeah. poltergeist. Enter the TV team with their ghost-busting gadgets. It's time-coded. I've always liked stories where scientific technology battles the supernatural. That goes back to a tradition of Nigel Neal and the stone tape and quite a mess. We tried to use all the technology that was available and right up to date. And um, the infrared camera had just come in and it was associated with the Gulf War at the time. So we used that. And then in the middle of that, you've got something that is genuinely peculiar, weird, scary, almost satanic. This monster, Mr. Pipes. Kim, how do you know he lives down there? Because I saw him through the crack. He was there, he was staring at me. What happened after you saw him? I drew a picture of him. Yeah, Mr. Pipes was the phantom in residence. The scariest television ghost since Michael Horden's sheet. Yeah. And just as intangible. Thank you very much. The director will tell you all the wonderful tricks that she used to build up the tension as far as Pipes is concerned. And you'd see him in all sorts of places. When I watch ghost stories or horror stories, when you see it, it's just not scary. So I'm really interested that fear is to do with being frightened of something you don't know about. Mike! On that basis, he only appeared as shadows in the background or flash frames that we cut in. My favourite bit of Ghost Watch actually is the part where someone phones in and Michael Parkinson says, says they're going to spool back the film to where someone saw something by the curtain. And um, we show the audience a figure by the curtain, but he says... I can't see anything now myself. False alarm? But Mr Pipes was getting more real every minute. The scariest moment, I think, is discovering Michelle, the elder of the two girls, in a catatonic state, covered in scratches. Oh, dear God. Oh, what an illusion. What do you want us to do? Sarah, what should we do? Sarah, you're all right. Get, get 
By now, thousands of worried viewers were reaching for the Ghost Watch hotline. Here, um, we're getting all sorts of calls in, in Derby. Someone that was one of the problems. They kept putting this phone in number up on the screen. The people who could get through got a recorded message saying, "This is not a, a live TV broadcast. This is a drama." But. Not many people heard that message because so many people were ringing that the, the, the system went into meltdown, which meant that the whole thing became, for anybody who was unnerved by it, it became even more unnerving. You know, there really seemed to be, to those people, some kind of terrible catastrophe unspooling in front of them. It was a War of the Worlds moment with a wild ending as Mr Pipes takes possession of the house... Sarah! ..and Sarah. <laughs> Then he goes after Parky. What happens is the ghost has got into the machine. I disappear under the stairs and get eaten by cats. And the wind's blowing and the things are going, there's tumbleweed going around the studio, and it's all gone mad. When you assure me that my wife is safe, well, we I have go. got an emergency generator. And Michael Parkinson, um, he becomes he becomes pipes in a way. And then the credits come up. All hell had broken loose. And now, all hell did break loose. Ghost watch. My 11-year-old son was left shaking and physically sick after 10 minutes. It was quite uh, extraordinary, really, the reaction, wasn't it? It was, mm. I mean, questions were raised in Parliament. And the BBC should be locked up for such a prank. The tabloids were ringing up. They all wanted to know, you know, the, the story behind it. And did we realise what, what chaos we'd all caused? And I'm sorry, I underestimated... No, I got, Can I please me? make my no, point? No, no, please. Yes. They got the programme makers in front of a panel of extremely angry audience members. Right, Natasha, McPeak, you, you watched it. What did you think on it? Well, I thought it was one sick joke. The way you can see the, the bafflement and the shell shock in the eyes of those people sitting in that studio, fielding questions from a very, very hostile audience. I think that you betrayed the trust that the audience has within the BBC. Well, I don't think it did. I think the lines were blurred, as well as us all suspending disbelief when we watch a drama. I think almost there'd been a suspension of disbelief about what the reaction might be. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Richard. Lucky they didn't go with the original ending. The idea originally was that the ghost kind of escaped through the TV screen into your homes. The, the idea was that, you know, kind of every home in the British Isles was kind of infected by this thing that escaped, but we never got away quite with that uh, shock ending, which is probably for the best, I think, in the end. Ghostwatch was never shown again on British television. But with its night vision cameras, its blurring of the lines between drama and reality, and the questions it raised about trust, it eerily predicted what was to come. I think if it wasn't for Ghostwatch, this whole tradition of the sort of psychic reality show, which is so prolific now, I think probably would have its root in that program as well. I think Ghostwatch is responsible for a whole genre. People sometimes ask me, you know, what would you do differently if you were making it now? And I say, well, you wouldn't make it now. If you, if you had the idea now, you'd quite simply just, just do it for real. You wouldn't bother doing it as a drama. That's the way television has changed, I think, in the last 20 years. You wouldn't write it, you'd just do it. The idea for Sounds uh, probably came mostly from Ghostwatch, which I'd been a big fan of. I think it was that idea of doing something that would sort of cross that idea of real and, and, and not real was a, was a huge appeal. Um, plus just loving the whole idea of seances and Victorian mediums and all that, it's always been a big, a big passion. And was to see, you know, whether or not those techniques would work on a modern, presumably sceptical audience. <laughs> Which they did, as it turned out.